Phthalates are plasticizers that impact the function of different types of plastics. While they have many different types of uses, there are mounting health concerns about them. There are ways that we can reduce our exposure, so let's talk about it. Hi everybody, I'm David Berger, a board certified pediatrician in Tampa, Florida, focusing on ways to prevent chronic health issues, and things that we do to have happier and much better lives. Today, we're going to be talking about phthalates and why they're used, what the health concerns are, and how we can minimize the, our exposure. Now, before we do get started, I got a bone to pick about this word itself, phthalates. Why? Because there's a silent P-H at the beginning, P-H, T-H, A-L-A-T-E-S. Why do we have those two letters there in the first place? It's just always stuck in my craw. And it's like ophthalmology, where there's an extra H in there. And again, there's the PH. And so, gosh, it took me 20 years to learn how to spell ophthalmology right now. I got this one right. But anyways, I digress. It's just, why do we have those letters in there? I don't know. Anyway, back to the phthalates themselves. So the definition. They are a group of chemicals as I said, they're compounds that are used as plasticizers. They're not plastics themselves, but they make plastics softer, more flexible, and more durable. And the, that's kind of the opposite of what BPA does, bisphenol A, because that tends to make plastics more solid, very rigid, as opposed to the softener. Now, as that it's not a plastic, therefore it's not a microplastics, and I've certainly given you videos about the concerns about microplastics and nanoplastics, but it's found within the nanoplastics. They're bound to them. So they're kind of transporting, they're kind of getting in, into the bodies in a similar way. Now, in terms of the use of in consumer products, it's widely present in all types of household, industrial products. It's in toys, in food packaging, medical devices, cosmetics, but also even more concerning, it's in IV tubing and in the nebulizer tubing that people are using for their medical treatments. And when it's in the IV, it's going straight into the bloodstream. When it's in tubing for a nebulizer for like an asthmatic inhaler, it's going straight into the airway, straight into the body. And of course, that is not a good thing to be happening. In addition, phthalates are used as stabilizers in a lot of fragrances. Now, of course, I, I'm personally, I don't know if you know, I've said it before, but you know, fragrances overall, they pretty much set me off and I really try to avoid any kind of perfumes and fragrances. I do any kind of like cleaners and detergents as fragrance free, but uh, if not, so it, it seems like because I've had an aversion to them, I've been avoiding it from that exposure for many years, but I'm sure I've had a lot of exposure through other ways. Now, in terms of understanding the health impacts, because the, the, there's concerns over there being an endocrine disruptor that it can have impacts on the health long-term from exposure. And now there's mounting evidence in certain types of, pro of tests, of studies, where it's impacting prenatal exposure and therefore fetal development and early childhood exposure as well. Now, in terms of the phthalates themselves, they were discovered about 100 years ago. But they really started getting widespread use in the mid part of the 20th century. So it's been like 70 years or so since it's really been just a staple of our environment, of our exposures. Now, there is some regulations already. In Europe, they have banned certain phthalates in toys, and there's more limited use um, in certain types of toys um, for children here. But there is this ongoing debate about broader restrictions, which to me, when there's health issues, should there really be that broad of a debate, or should we be avoiding something that we know is a problem? Now, first of all, with children, there's increased concern because there's increased vulnerability. First of all, of course, with kids, and they're the ones most likely playing with toys and plastic objects, kids have much more of a tendency of putting their hands right into their mouth afterwards, whereas adults don't do that as much. But also in terms of the overall exposure, if a person like a child is weighing, a, 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 a one-year-old is weighing 20 pounds versus say, somebody who weighs 120 pounds, that same amount of phthalate exposure would hit the body six times more based upon body weight in an infant compared to an older person. So of course, it's going to be more exposure based upon body weight. There's like lots of medications we dose based upon body weight. There's not just a one size fits all until it gets to adults. In terms of the health risks themselves, so the prenatal exposure development of effects, it's associated with lower birth weight, 
early puberty, brain development issues. I'll get into that in a little bit more based upon some of the studies. It's also been a, and it can cause respiratory issues and allergic reactions. It can exacerbate those. And again, if the asthmatics and the allergy risk, but yet it's in nebulizers. So this most vulnerable population to having problems with respiratory issues are getting exposed when they do an asthma treatment. It's like ridiculous, but it's happening. It's also been um, relative to endocrine disruption, neurological impact. When it comes to hormones, the function, it disrupts androgen functioning, and that can lead to incomplete male genital, genital development. Part of me. In fact, there was one study that had shown that males exposed in utero have a 30% reduction in the anogenital distance. So that's where the scrotum starts to where the, the anus starts, that space in between. And when that space is reduced, that is actually a very key biomarker of disruption of, an, of androgen activity. But of course, it's not going to be just affecting the external genitalia. It's going to be impacting internal genitalia as well. And obviously the development thereof. So in addition, it's been associated with lower IQ, increased risk for autism, impaired executive functioning skills as well. Now, there have been two really big studies that have come out, especially relative to prenatal exposure and, and really young exposure. One of them is called the ECHO study, which stands for the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes. And this is an NIH-funded um, study. It's a large-scale study that's been going on for a while that the government's been looking at, and it looks at different types of environmental factors not just for phthalates, but other things as well that we've talked about. Um, and what they do is they, they look to see what the impact is on childhood, um, on childhood health, childhood health outcomes. So what the research from this project has shown is that um, they, they looked at your at, um, maternal exposure to phthalates and they broke them into quad into quadrals. So the t under 25%, 25 to 50, 50 to 75. 75 to 100 percent um, in terms of the percentile. So that's not how much they were exposed to, but this person, the, the ones in the lowest were in this quad trial, the one in the highest in this quad trial. And what they found is that those in the highest quad trial of exposure compared to the lowest, that their offspring had seven IQ points lower than those in the lowest quadrant. In addition, they found that there was a 32 percent increase in the risk of behavioral dysregulation including attention problems and emotional dis, um, difficulties in child, in the children who are in that highest quadrile of exposure. Now, the PROTECT study, which stands for the Puerto Rico Testing for ex, um, Test Site, excuse me, for Exploration, um, Exploring Contaminated Threats, so the PROTECT. And it also is looking at environmental exposures, again, not just phthalates, and what their pregnancy outcomes were. And what this study found in the Puerto Rican population was that the women who had the highest urinary phthalate, so they were looking at what's coming out of the body this time, as opposed to just the exposure, but they had the two, a 2.3 times greater likelihood of going into preterm labor. And preterm labor causes all types of health issues um, that really goes on for life. But also there was a particular phthalate called diethyl hexothalate or DEHP, and that was associated with a 25% reduction in birth weight. So um, in that case, low birth weight babies often also have lots of health issues that babies who are born within the range that they're supposed to for their age, their gestational age, that can be a big problem. Now, in addition, though, because this is not just a problem for children, there are hormone imbalances and reproductive health issues in adults, reducing testosterone levels in men. They can have impacts, um, of course, therefore, on both fertility and overall reproductive function. It's been linked to metabolic disorders, um, association with us, obesity, with insulin resistance, which, of course, that's what leads to type 2 diabetes. It's been associated with cancers and chronic um, diseases like breast cancer, liver toxicity, and there's also mounting concerns over cardiovascular concerns as well. And now, of course, it, relative to all of this, exposure can also be environmental based upon a person's work. So if you're working in, in, in the industries where there's high levels of exposures, you're going to be at the highest risk. And of course, those um, increase um, in particularly the plastic industry and medical manufacturing. So 
I talked a little bit before about the connection with plastics. And as I said, it's not a plastic, but it's found within the plastic. So when plastics are broken down, phthalates are released. And of course, that leads to environmental contamination as well, showing up in our food supply, water and air. It's been detected in bottled water, household dust, food supplies. And now also there's a bioaccumulation because they don't break down very fast. And so therefore it has even a bigger in, um, environment impact. It's being found in marine life. It's been found in wildlife just out there, not just things on farms um, that were necessarily directly eating, but the entire food chain therefore can be impacted here. Now, also, there does seem to be a synergistic effect with the microplastics. And again, if you review the videos that I've done on this, they cause a lot of the same issues. So there's like synergistic, again, additive, if not multiplicative effect. Now, what can we do about this? There are healthier alternatives. So there are phthalate-free plastics, um, and there are substitutes, and they are becoming increased availability um, alternatives. And you probably will see that there are phthalate, just like you would say, BP free, um, B, um, I'm sorry, BPA free um, plastics, but there could still be a problem. You'll, I'm sure you're going to start seeing, if not already, phthalate free PVC alternatives. Um, there are also used other kind of biologically based or other safer chemicals that are not phthalates at all. Now, also in terms of um, personal care products, as I just said, it can be in cosmetics, but there are natural and sustainable products. Um, there is, of course, been a rise in fragrance-free or naturally scented cosmetics, and of course, that's great. <coughs> and so the developing of safer lotions, shampoos, nail polishes. But of course, they could be in those bottles because most of the, the, the packaging for those types of products are soft plastics, and therefore, they're probably going to have phthalates in it themselves. Now, of course, we can be learning more about the products. We can be identifying the phthalate contaminated, uh, containing products by reading labels um, and looking for things like if it says DBP, DEP, or DEHP on ingredient lists in foods. But other you know, toys and other products, they're not going to have ingredient lists. So you probably have to contact the manufacturer to see what is in their products. And there's all these material data sheets that are available um, that they kind of have to produce for you if you ask on them. If not, you can tell them you're going to report them um, because they have to tell you what's in their products. They can't just put mercury in their products and not tell you that either. So there needs to be policy shifts. There needs to be changes in, in the industries as well. Hopefully now that we have, um, we're going to, there's so much awareness now when it comes to the different types of toxic exposures, and there will hopefully be a push going forward to minimizing our exposures to better regulations, as well as research coming up with better uh, products out there. But we also need to have an increased public demand. We need to get information out to what the, what the dangerous products are. We need to be telling these companies to change. We need to stop buying them. And that's what's going to cause probably the biggest change if no one's buying their products because that's what's going to make them change because they're not going to be able to answer to their stockholders if people aren't in a, if people don't, they don't figure out a way to make people buy their products again. So overall, you know, we've talked about what the long-term risks are, especially to our children, but of course to adults as well. But, you know, children, especially vulnerable populations, as we've talked about. So we need to take it upon ourselves. We need to figure out how to reduce exposure. We need to advocate for it, all of those things. But we can do it. You know, we can do it. We took lead out of gasoline 50 years ago. We can do this now. But it's up to me. It's up to you. It's up to contacting our policymakers and, of course, the industries that are exposing us at all. So now you've learned something about pff, phthalates. <laughs> phthalates and uh you know pass the information along share this information subscribe to this channel so that you can get more information because as you know i'm especially part of my making healthy kids series we're getting the information out there but i can only go so much you need to share it with people too have a nice day mm -hmm.